it's an honor to be here today to share with you a little bit about my experience as a U.S. Army Muslim chaplain who served down in Guantanamo Bay uh, in late 2002 and early 2003. Just real briefly giving you a little bit of extra notes about my background. Uh, I'm a West Point graduate. I come from a family that is rather rooted in the military. My younger brother is also a graduate of West Point. I have another younger brother who today serves on active duty as a U.S. Army physician, doctor at Fort Hood in Texas. And my father too, also a U.S. born citizen who turned 83 this year, served in the U.S. Army when he was drafted during World War II. So I come from a, a military family, so to speak. But I, I was assigned the uh, task of being the Muslim chaplain in Guantanamo in November 2002, and what I'd like to do is share with you some of the things that really concerned me, that caused me to raise concerns to the chain of command. Uh, it's quite openly known now that Guantanamo Bay ha has been a location where prisoners have certainly been subjected to treatment that falls within the, the category of cruel and human and degrading and included outrages on personal dignity. As a chaplain in the US military, my first and foremost role was to defend religious rights, religious freedom. And that's what we do in the military. We, de we defend religious freedoms, we provide religious accommodations to those who serve the military, to those who may be employed on a military installation, and to those who may be incarcerated or imprisoned by the U.S. military. And certainly that was the situation I was in when I went down to Guantanamo, knowing first and foremost that my role was to provide that religious freedom, provide the religious accommodations for the prisoners in Guantanamo. But going down to Guantanamo, it was immediate that I recognized things weren't right. And let me share with you some of the things that really disturbed me most. In my view, what was most disturbing to me as a chaplain was how I would observe the way religion was being used as a weapon, as a weapon against these prisoners. And because each prisoner was a person of the Muslim faith, it was essentially the use of Islam against these prisoners. In what ways? From desecrating the Quran, the holy book of Islam, a book in which Muslims all over the world consider to be the literal words of God, was used in interrogations, being desecrated, being abused, being disrespected in front of prisoners who sat shackled in their chairs in order to try and elicit response from them or to try and gain information or what they would call in the military intelligence from these individuals. Investigations were later carried out into abuses towards the Quran at Guantanamo and they revealed that the Qurans were indeed tossed on the ground, were sat on, or even urinated on by U.S. personnel during the time I was in Guantanamo. And I was very much aware of this, even though I was not part of the intelligence side of the operation. I was aware this was going on because it was posed problems for the entire operation and it was a matter that was discussed back in 2003. This was not made public, or this, in, these incidences of abuse towards the Quran were not made public until later in 2005, first by Newsweek magazine. But there were other ways in which religion was being used as a weapon, another way U.S. military and U.S. federal interrogators would exploit another aspect of Muslim culture, that which entails separation of the sexes. In a conservative Islamic society, you find the etiquette of men and women separating. In an Islamic center, even here in the United States, you find a place for women to pray, you find a place for the men to pray. You find a situation very different than what we see in this auditorium with men and women sitting together. It was well known by U.S. personnel in Guantanamo, especially in the intelligence arena, 
that this is an aspect of Muslim culture. And they tried to exploit this when they utilized their female interrogators in a very gross manner. Some of the female interrogators were very ready to conduct an interrogation session of a Muslim male prisoner by herself stripping off her own clothes, standing naked in front of a male prisoner, believing or knowing that may, perhaps many of these young men, young, many of these young Muslim men, come from conservative Islamic societies, never having been exposed in this manner physically to a woman. They would go further than that and would rub their own bodies, their own personal private areas on these Muslim male prisoners as they sat defenseless, shackled in their chairs. Investigations into abuses of prisoners in Guantanamo even suggest that some of these female interrogators went as far as grabbing the genitals of Muslim male prisoners in the course of interrogating them. All of this was done because they knew it would be humiliating to the prisoner and these interrogators believed it would help them gain information from the prisoners or even possibly a confession. But things were even more than that. Another way in which religion I, I, I found out was being used as a weapon was a way in which a prisoner described for me an interrogation room. An interrogation room was simply a room that had in the center of it a chair where a prisoner would be shackled or even short shackled to a small D-ring in the ground. But this particular room that was described for me by a prisoner was a, 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 a room, an empty room with a large circle marked on the floor. And in the center of the circle was another symbol it was a symbol of Satan. It was like a pentagram star-shaped symbol that represents Satan, the satanic symbol. And an interrogator would take a prisoner who they knew believed in one God. That's the core belief of Islam, to believe in one God. And they would put this Muslim prisoner in the center of the satanic circle and attempt to force him to bow down and pray, like in the form of the Islamic prayer. You've seen when Muslims pray, we put our forehead to the ground in honor of worshiping one God. They've tried to force these Muslim prisoners to bow down and prostrate in the center of this satanic circle while they would scream at these prisoners that Satan is your God now. Not Allah, not God, the Almighty, the creator of all things, the creator of the heavens and the earth. This was done because it was understood, the core, the core belief of Islam was understood by U.S. personnel and they tried to break Muslims from this. And no doubt it was humiliating to prisoners. There were other things from beards being forcibly shaven by U.S. personnel, knowing that many Muslims, many male Muslims believe that it is an obligation upon them to be pious by wearing a beard. Sometimes the water in the cells was turned off before prayer times so that prisoners would not be able to wash before prayer. There was something else I would learn later. Some interrogators would disguise themselves, dress themselves up as Catholic priests, going into an interrogation room and forcefully baptizing a Muslim prisoner, essentially saying, you've now been baptized into the Christian religion, no longer are you a Muslim. Things like that. These are the types of things that disturbed me outright as a chaplain in the US military. And I would raise concerns. I would suffer for raising those concerns and objections, as I myself would later be thrown in prison, accused of being a terrorist spy, of aiding the enemy, being threatened with the death penalty by my own government. I would later be cleared of all those accusations, my record wiped clean, resign from the U.S. military and receive an honorable discharge. In general, these are some of the things that I saw. Uh, what I'd like to do real quickly before I turn to our next speaker is really quickly show you some of the conditions of Guantanamo and what it is like for prisoners to be in Guantanamo, or what it was like when, when I was there and prisoners were in Guantanamo. 
look at the, some of the pictures that I've, I've got here. This is the front gates of Guantanamo where I was signed a place known as Camp Delta. This is a photo showing how prisoners were initially transported to Guantanamo, hooded and shackled in the back of these large military cargo planes. What was disturbing to me, not only to see these individuals hooded and strapped, but I was also disturbed to see what was hanging over their head, our American flag. This tells the world this is the United States. Another look at the transport to Guantanamo. An infant, uh, now infamous picture that was released by the Pentagon, which shows how prisoners were subjected to sensory deprivation, forced to kneel, being shackled in the, the hot suns of, of Cuba, Guantanamo. This was actually the first prison camp opened in Guantanamo, Camp X-Ray, made of chain link fences. It was very temporary. A closer look at the sensory deprivation, a tactic that was done to instill fear, intimidation, and confusion. A tactic that was used on me when I was arrested and thrown in prison, accused of being a terrorist spy. And that's what Camp X-Ray looks like when you take a picture from the top. It doesn't look like a facility where human beings would be held, but maybe more appropriate for animals. And many of the prisoners expressed they felt like they were being treated like animals. When I got to Guantanamo, Camp Delta was up and running. The, the prison cells in Guantanamo were made of sturdier steel mesh in cell blocks like this. Inside the cell block, you had 48 cells, 24 on one side, 24 on the other, and a long corridor down the middle. If you went in the cell, this is what you would find, a small cubicle. But this is a picture the Pentagon also released, and they would describe it to you like this. Look how good the prisoners in Guantanamo have it. Look how shiny the floor is and how clean it's kept. These Muslims, they have their own in-ground toilet that they are culturally familiar with. They can wash before prayer with that little water fountain. We give them some of these things, which we call comfort items, a game of checkers, a deck of cards, so they can pass the time while they're here in Guantanamo. We even tell them which way is Mecca, so they can pray properly, or give them a few extra packets of salt, which makes the food taste a little better. In Guantanamo, we refer to these things as comfort items, like they're staying at the Comfort Inn or something like that. But it's no five-star hotel. It's an empty cell with a flimsy plastic mattress, very cage-like, as you can see, the steel mesh. That's the sturdier steel mesh that the prisoners would look through on a daily basis. And when they did, of course, everything just becomes a blur. Here we see a detainee being escorted, and we were ordered to call these prisoners detainees. We couldn't call them prisoners because someone might think we're talking about prisoners of war. But prisoners of war have rights. So we were ordered to refer to them as detainees because the chain of command said these individuals did not have any rights. Camp 4 was a medium security facility built when I was in Guantanamo. It allowed prisoners to pray together and live in groups of 10. Very, very few individuals ever made it to Camp 4, getting to jump, switch out of those orange jumpsuits. Camp Iguana is where they held the juvenile enemy combatants. Juvenile enemy combatants. 12 years old, 14 years old, held in this separate facility known as Camp Iguana. This was one of the juveniles that was held in Guantanamo. In fact, he's still held today. He was 15 years old when he was brought to Guantanamo Bay. His name is Omar Qadr, and he's a citizen of Canada. His case will probably be the first case that the Obama administration carries out under the military commissions. That was him when he was captured. We can see the big wounds in his shoulder. That's not where US ammunition entered his body. It's where it exited, which tells you what? He was shot in the back. Okay. Camp Echo was a very, very isolated facility, a place where the prisoner could not even see sunlight. Today there's Camp 5 and Camp 6, concrete floors, 
steel metal locking doors. They were not there when I was in Guantanamo. They were subsequently built. And guess by who? A subsidiary of Halliburton. If you go into one of these new Camp 5 cells, that's what it looks like. Very, very claustrophobic. Camp 6 is almost the same, but two tier, about 200 cells. My understanding is most of the prisoners have now been moved to these more isolated cells of Camp 5 and 6. This is known as Camp 7, or sometimes referred to as Camp No, because supposedly it doesn't exist. Camp No. This is where the very high value prisoners, the 19 or so prisoners President Bush took out of the CIA black sites and brought to Guantanamo in order to get the 2006 Military Commissions Act passed. That's an interrogation room. The D-ring on the ground. And the detainee hospital. Those are just some of the facilities that you find in Guantanamo the conditions under which they lived. I've spoken about some of the abuses. I've shown you some photos about the awful conditions under how prisoners were kept. You now have a little bit better idea of what really goes on, what we call inside the wire, inside Guantanamo Bay. I look forward to all your comments and questions after our final panelists. Thank you.